Well, I think the numbers are starting to level up now. So I think I'm in a position to uh, welcome you and uh, thank you all for joining us here uh, uh, for this evening's Monday at the Mess Talk, the Anglo-Irish Treaty with Donald Fallon. I'd especially like to welcome members of the Dublin Local History Meetup Group, some of whom are joining us uh, here this evening. Uh, Monday at the Mess is a series of talks organised by Richmond Barracks and Inchicor that celebrate the rich stories and experiences of the local community, past and present. Richmond Barracks is run by the Dublin City Council Culture Company, which runs cultural initiatives and buildings across the city with and for the people uh, of Dublin. My name is Fergus Whelan. In a few minutes, I'm going to hand you over to our, uh, to our speaker for tonight, Donald Fallon. But before that, before the start, I want to let you know that there will be some time for questions at the end of the session. And if you'd like to ask a question, use the Q&A button at the uh, bottom of your screen. And we'll do our best to uh, get to as many of the questions as we can. Now, this talk has been recorded and we'll be making it available at a later date. If you're interested in when that will be, please sign up for our newsletter, which uh, we, will put, we will put a link to the newsletter uh, in, the, in the chat box uh, during uh, uh, this event. Our speaker today, I'm sure most of you know, Donald Fallon. Donald is a historian, broadcaster, author and curator from Dublin. Formerly a historian in residence at Dublin City Council, he's the author of numerous studies of 20th, 20th century Dublin. His most recent one being 14 Henrietta Street, from tenements to suburbia, uh, 1922 to 1979. You probably know, you should know, he produces the Three Castles Boarding podcast. Uh, if you haven't, if you don't know that, or if you haven't tuned into it, you must uh, you must do it without delay. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, resource. And you've been uh, on it and, twice, and you've been and, on it twice. <laughs> and he's very and, and, and he's very prolific also. So it'll take you a long time to catch up with the work he's done uh, uh, in the last year or so. He's contributed to publications such as the Jacobin the Dublin Historical Review, Sayher, which is the Journal of the Irish Labour History Society and the Irish Times. Uh, Donald Fallon is a social historian for Dublin City Council Culture Company. So, Donald, over to you. Thank you very much, Fergus, for that for that introduction. And uh, I don't know if you heard me say it there, but he's been on it twice on the podcast, two, two lovely editions. Um, this is the bit that always terrifies me, getting a slideshow up and running. But... Slide. Um, how do I display? Ah, oh, here we go. Great. So, has that worked? If you can see my slides, we're away. Uh, thank you so much to Fergus for that for that introduction. Uh, we come towards just about the end uh, of the decade of centenaries, and we enter perhaps the most difficult centenary uh, of it, which is the 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 civil war, which is on the horizon. I would argue that. What we're talking about today, the Anglo-Irish Treaty and, and all that came from it, it didn't just shape politics in the immediate uh, in an Irish context. I would maintain that for decades uh, in the aftermath of, of these events, the, the ricochet effect uh, was to be felt. One of the memoirs of 20th century Ireland, I think, is that of Dr. Noel Brown. Noel Brown, probably best remembered as, as Minister for Health, uh, who clashed with the, the Catholic hierarchy over the, the mother and child scheme. But in his memoir against the tide, Noel talks about going into the doll as a young man uh, in the late 1940s and being in amazed by the manner in which the treaty, the civil war at that time still shaped Irish political identities. And it's worth saying on the other side of things, the two respective sides, pro-treaty and anti-treaty, had both been in power by this time. And you know, the pro-treaty side had handed power over peacefully. Uh, the De Valera's Fianna Fáil party in the 1930s. But despite that, you know, even by the late 40s, Noel Brown felt that there were ghosts of the past, if you will, loitering around Leinster House. And I love the way he describes it. As a young politician in Leinster House, I recall my shock at the white hot hate with which that terrible episode had marked their lives. And then referencing atrocities in the Civil War, the trigger words were 77, Bally Seedy, and above all, the treaty. The raised tears of the doll chamber would become filled with shouting, gesticulating, clamoring, suddenly angry men. 
when we talk about the Anglo-Irish Treaty, uh, as we will be doing today, I think there's a couple of things that are really important in, in how we frame the discussion. So we need to look at what happened that led to that table in London. You know, how did the likes of uh, Lord Birkenhead, Winston Churchill, Michael Collins end up sitting around the table trashing out the future of Ireland? And I think we have to understand what was the catalyst for it. Why did Ireland move from being in a situation of guerrilla warfare to a truce which enabled negotiations to begin? So how did this happen? I think it's also important to look at what were the terms of the treaty, what was in it, but equally, it's very important at what wasn't in it. So in recent days, in the lead up to this centenary, um, I've heard a lot of talk on the radio and, 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 and even in, in printed newspapers, people talk about the treaty as the document that partitioned Ireland. But as we'll hear today, that's not true. You know, partition was already an established reality, a political fact, uh, because of the Government of Ireland Act from a year earlier. So, you know, it's important to look at just what was in the treaty and what wasn't in it uh, as well. Look at the cold facts of what was in this document. And then it's important to look at the response to it. And there's all kinds of different, I suppose you might, you might call them stakeholders uh, in the responses. You know, what was the response amongst the revolutionary forces? You know, how did the IRA feel about the treaty? But also broader nationalism, you know, cultural nationalism, uh, the trade union movement. You know, how did these various people feel about the treaty? And then the very important part, how did the public feel uh, about the treaty? Um, one of the best things I think about the, the decade of centenaries is that there's been a real move, a real focus more towards that social history of trying to understand not just politics at the high table of politics, but you know how these things were seen uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a local level and amongst the people of Ireland themselves. And I think the most important way we can get a sense of how Irish people felt about the treaty, you'll see it in the very last slides today, when we look at the election results from the first election that was held in the new Irish Free State, it's very, very surprising how people voted. I think it revealed something very deep. It's all ahead of us. Propaganda around the treaty, uh, important, I suppose, in its own way. I always make the point that there is two very strong teams. The, the pro-treaty propaganda tended to emphasise, in a similar vein to what Michael Collins said in the doll, that the treaty was not freedom, but it was the freedom to achieve freedom. A very pragmatic uh, approach. The treaty gives Ireland a parliament responsible to the Irish people alone, a government responsible to that parliament, democratic control of legislative affairs, an Irish army, complete financial freedom, a national flag and the like. On the other side, and you find later on when we pull quotes from the Dáil debates, the pro-treaty line tends to be what you see on that poster, the freedom to achieve freedom, and the anti-treaty line tends to be much more rooted in a, in, a, in a sense of Republican ideology, the belief that the Republic had been established by force of arms uh, in 1916, and that this was a betrayal of the Republic, that there couldn't be a solution to the Irish question within a colonial framework. In terms of getting Britain to the table, in terms of allowing the negotiations of the treaty to happen, uh, my friend Porigog O'Rourke, fantastic local historian of the War of Independence, the points that he makes, I think, are very, very important in, in framing this all, that Britain was incredibly war weary. And on the news talk, I was watching David McCullough uh, of, of RT News in, in London doing a, a special report on the centenary of the treaty. And he put this question to a historian uh, around the treaty, that the threat that was apparently made by the Prime Minister Lloyd George of immediate and terrible war. Was Britain in a position to launch immediate and terrible war on Ireland if we rejected the treaty? And I think when you read the research of Porigog Rock, you're inclined to think maybe not, that Britain in its own way may have been running out of steam in Ireland. Porig looked at war weariness among the British uh, and some incredible statistics found in his research. The suicide rate within the Royal Irish Constabulary, an incredible thing to look at for a historian. By 1920, the suicide rate within the RIC, Porig writes, had reached 36.36 36 per 100,000 the population. But that was compared to 5.45% amongst the civilian uh, population. It rose to 88.8 .8 in, 8 in 1921. The rates of desertion among British soldiers in Ireland, Porig writes, were seven times greater than those stationed uh, in Britain. 
And one of the peculiarities of the War of Independence, we call it the War of Independence, but in Britain, there was a refusal to call it a war as it was underway. And you get this great line from the top of the, uh, the British military that stress on all ranks was, quote, incomparably greater than in time of actual war. Actual war, as in this isn't the real war. But I think that's very, very important in understanding how we ended up in a situation that people like Michael Collins, Arthur Griffith, are sitting at a table of politics in London. War weariness is a real thing. Bernard Montgomery, uh, of course, a, a hero of Britain in the Second World War, maintained that to win a war of this sort, you need to be ruthless. Oliver Cromwell or the Germans would have settled it in a very short time. Nowadays, public opinion precludes such methods. And Montgomery isn't wrong there. And increasingly hostile attitude to the war in Ireland exists uh, across the British press uh, by the summer of 1921. And there had been strong anti-war feeling in Britain in you know, the likes of the Manchester Guardian, the Liberal Papers, even earlier than this. But now it's in the, now it's in the Conservative press as well in, in a significant way. There's real condemnation of the policy of reprisals uh, in Ireland as 1921 goes on. Famously, one British politician told the House of Commons, there's no policy of reprisals in Ireland, but if there is, it's working. But Britain is losing the war, at least the propaganda war, uh, as far as the British public uh, is concerned. So you see incredible things like this in 1921 appearing in the press. Uh, this policy of using IRA prisoners uh, as hostages uh, in Dublin. You know, there's a real problem uh, in Dublin with grenade attacks on British army vehicles as they're making their way through the city, especially in the area around Camden. Uh, the, the, it becomes a frequent tactic of the IRA in, in, in south inner city Dublin. Uh, and they begin taking prisoners with them as hostages as they move through the city. This is front page news uh, in the Sunday pictorial. I love that front page. It tells you a lot about Britain in, in, in 1921. Look at the, the top of it. Should women be jurors? By <laughs> Mr. Bottomley, MP. But the propaganda war is definitely being lost uh, in Britain. The morale is very, very low among the British public. Uh, and there's a desire that this question be answered. Anti-reprisals association is born in the winter of 1920 in England, but it gains influence, really, as 1921 uh, goes on. Very significant people are involved in it. G.K. Chesterton, the writer, MPs uh, from both sides uh, of the House of Commons, voting government and opposition. And Desmond Fitzgerald, father of Garrett Fitzgerald, uh, of the Dáil, felt that the efforts of those people in England were, quote, most damaging to England's prestige. There's the Peace with Ireland Council, which includes MPs uh, from both liberal and conservative parties uh, and members of the trade unions. Oswald Mosley MP, later the founder of the British Union of Fascists, actually crosses the floor in Parliament uh, because he's disgusted by the policy of reprisals uh, in Ireland. It's not that Mosley is in any way sympathetic to Sinn Féin, far from it, uh, but he regards it as most un-British, you know, the way in which the war in Britain uh, is being fought. And I love that cartoon from the contemporary press of Prime Minister Lloyd George just splattering Ireland with black and tan paint. And outside opinion says, a pretty mess you're making of the whole thing. So 1921 is a time, I think, when right across the political board in Britain, there's a real desire to just get this thing out to us. The IRA are kind of in trouble too. Richard Horrigan writes in an Atlas of Irish History that the numbers there uh, are not particularly good. By June 1921, she writes, the volunteers had about 4,500 members in turn, which is extraordinary. And she estimates, uh, and I'm not inclined to disagree with this figure, that there's perhaps as many as two and a half times uh, more IRA men interned or imprisoned uh, than there are in active service. They're up against almost 40,000 troops and just over 14,200 RIC. Well, they could not hope to win a military victory, I think she's right on this. The IRA fights on in whatever way it can across the country, depending on local conditions. And she maintains that that, that fact, combined with international criticism, had finally convinced Lloyd George of the need to compromise. And the last great spectacular uh, of the War of Independence in Dublin, of course, was the burning of the Custom House in May 1921. 
So half of the casualties sustained in the War of Independence in six months of 1921, which is extraordinary. And I know we, we, we say the War of Independence begins in 1919, but you know, in truth, the Spanish flu was far more likely to kill a British soldier or a policeman in Ireland in 1919 uh, than the IRA were. I mean, what's, what's remarkable about the War of Independence, I think, is the way it escalates at different points. And in the early months of 1921, it reaches just an incredible tempo uh, that hadn't been seen before. Days before the announcement of a truce, Winston Churchill, who's very much uh, a hawk in politics and in political affairs when it comes to Ireland, changes his tune and basically tells his cabinet colleagues that we should consider the failure of the policy of force, which is most on, on church on Churchill like language. But this moment in time, I think what's brought it about overwhelmingly is that sense of war weariness on both sides. Neville McCready meets, Jennifer McCready, essentially the officer in charge of British forces in Ireland, meets Sinn Féin leaders in the Mansion House in Dublin and a truce is agreed, which ultimately paves the way for negotiations and the treaty. I love the picture of McCready arriving uh, at the Mansion House in Dublin, I think you start to wonder about his own fate in the negotiations. If you look in his pocket, you can very, very clearly see that McCready's brought his gun along, just in case this ends up in a shootout. But the truce that's agreed would come into being on the 11th of July. There's real euphoria uh, across the island of Ireland at the declaration of a truce. I love this image uh, from the streets of Dublin. Tricolours in the hands of uh, Dublin children. Tells you a lot really about social class as well in the, in, in the city. Some of the children have shoes on their feet and fine coats. Uh, some of them don't. In Belfast, there's very vicious rioting. Remember the 11th of July, it's right on the eve uh, of the 12th of July celebrations in the north. And this tells us a lot about how the truce is viewed. Nationalists view it as something of a success, but there's a line among unionists uh, that this could be something of a surrender, and there's, there's a, a real fear of what could follow. Dan Breen, one of the IRA men who had begun the War of Independence, in the Salahed Beg ambush of 1919, writes about the truce in his memoir. The declaration of the truce was welcomed by the people at large. By many, it was thought that the recognition of the Republic was but a matter of time. The long nightmare period of terror was over, and in their reaction, people were inclined to think that victory had already been won. In many places, bonfires were lit, but these were promptly extinguished by the volunteers, who saw the necessity of restraining such premature manifestations of exultation. Strange things are happening in the IRA uh, when the truce is declared and there's no one feeling within the organization uh, on how things stand. Ernie O'Malley, who's detained during the war under the name Bernard Stewart, hence the photograph B. Stewart. Ernie O'Malley, who's the officer commanding of the second Southern Division, he writes in his memoir that where he was, it felt like things were getting better all the time. And he was quite surprised by the declaration of the truce. Our area was improving daily. The people were becoming more staunch in their allegiance to the Republic and the British as a government no longer functioned. O'Malley is a voice to be taken seriously. He had a very intimate knowledge of the IRA's ability on the ground. Uh, O'Malley was an organiser who you know, travels the country and often reports back to Dublin uh, general headquarters on how things are looking across the island of Ireland. But it's worth saying many people in the IRA especially at a leadership level, uh, don't share Ernie's optimism of how the war is going. They're very conscious that there's an absence, not only of men, because of how many are in prison, but ammunition. It was becoming increasingly difficult to get arms into the country. Uh, there's a disastrous moment where the Thompson submachine gun, the Tommy gun, is due uh, into the country uh, and you know, on the eve of, of its export from the United States, uh, a very large number of Thompson submachine guns are intercepted uh, by what we now know is the FBI, and, and they never make it uh, to Ireland. They put a lot of faith 
in the various channels that they had to get guns into the country from America, uh, from Liverpool and the like. But by the summer of 1921, it's becoming increasingly difficult to get weapons into the country, primarily because British intelligence is getting better on the ground. So there's a real problem there uh, as far as the IRA is concerned. And what O'Malley is saying could be true. You know, O'Malley could be right that the people were becoming more staunch in their allegiance to the Republic. That can be true. But that doesn't mean that the IRA is still in a position uh, to fight on. So many people in the IRA welcome the truce. The historian Marie Coleman, based up in Queen's University, uh, she makes a good point that by May 1921, the IRA is in quite a lot of trouble. And one way you see that, she writes, is how they, they talk about combining the IRA in various counties across county lines. Longford had grown so ineffective, there was talk of combining it uh, with Leitrim. It's extraordinary to think that, that that's the situation on the ground. David Fitzpatrick, the late David Fitzpatrick, who, who studied Clare and the war in Clare, he found that while the IRA was getting better at ambushing and better at fighting, while they had vastly improved as a fighting force, by this point they were too poorly armed to have much hope of dislodging the enemy by strongholds. The IRA grows quite rapidly uh, in the immediate aftermath uh, of the truce. Brian Hanley is one of the leading authorities on, on uh, the IRA and all its guises through 20th century history. He suggests that by the end of the year, there were 72,000 people, 72,000 volunteers uh, within the ranks of the IRA. And pictures like this are extraordinary. You see loads of images like this taken after the truce. And when you think that there's an intelligence war on, that the British are gathering intelligence on Republicans. They're incredibly unwise pictures to take, but there are pictures of uh, flying columns posing, training camps, uh, pictures of volunteers parading through town squares, uh, in some on, on some occasions, pictures of volunteers holding the Thompson submachine gun, the few of them that managed to get into the country. These are very unwise from an intelligence point of view. Uh, Collins and other people are very annoyed by the new culture that emerges within the ranks of the IRA. Ragged Oshul, an IRA officer in Monaghan laments how men who had been under orders, total abstainers, both from liquor and ladies, were now being feted and treated in pubs and were talking to gossipy girls. The men had gone soft. The belief that there was a breakdown in, in military discipline. Later on, the pro-treaty side uh, tend to pour scorn on, on these people and call them trusaliers. Uh, the, the, the emotional argument on both sides is different. In the anti-treaty side, they often talk about how many members of the Free State were ex-British Army, that they recruit ex-British Army. And then on the other side, the pro-treaty side tend to emphasise the belief that many anti-treaty people had joined after the fighting of the War of Independence. They call them trusaliers. Pierce Beasley, 1916 veteran, uh, interned in Richmond Barracks after the Rising, a uh, very senior and important figure throughout the War of Independence and, and the subsequent Free State Government. Uh, he talks about them as 11th hour warriors in comparatively peaceful parts of the country, hastened to make up arrears by firing shots at the last minute. And attacks on the English forces, there were attacks that should be to cope with the Bureau, and English forces up to within a few minutes of truce. Those belated ex exhibitions of prowess with no military objective when the danger seen past reflected no credit on Irishmen. So there's a lot of emotive talk uh, in the years that follow around the latter stages. British are eager to talk. That's clear uh, from the time of the, of the truce. Initially, a series of four meetings are held in London between David Lloyd George uh, and Eamon de Valera, internationally recognised uh, as president of the Irish Republic, self-styled. I say internationally recognised, I mean amongst you know, the, the Irish diaspora uh, and the like. Very, very little in the line of any kind of formal recognition. Correspondence to Dublin from London uh, is interesting after the truce. Really one of the first recognitions uh, from London that there is a government or a de facto government in Dublin. Uh, Dev is referred to in a letter from Lloyd George as the chieftain of the vast majority of the Irish race. Now, Dáil Éireann, as far as the British were concerned to this point, was an illegal assembly. It had been driven underground 
uh, the IRA are never referred to as the IRA. They're referred to in, in the House of Commons as the murder gang. But now you have this change in, 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 in public pronouncements and you have a, a, a buttering up, if you will, uh, of, of the Republican government problem. Here's some interesting tactics in doing this. Uh, the Boers are utilized. The, the Boer War, the second Boer War from 1899 to 1902 uh, have been a really defining moment for a lot of Irish nationalists. It was uh, a conflict that sparked uh, massive sympathy amongst Republicans. Uh, a small band of Irish nationalists had actually fought alongside the Boers, uh, including Major John McBride, executed in, in 1916. Uh, the names of Boer generals, the West, Bota, you know, were, were, were known to every child in Ireland. Uh, when the Boer War was on, the Boers became heroes, these plucky uh, little Dutch farmers in South Africa who'd gone out and fought the British Empire. But ultimately, the Boers had made their peace with the British Empire. And the British very cleverly try and use the Boers uh, in, in, in buttering up uh, the Irish. So General John Smuts uh, encourages Dáil Éireann to talk to the British and, you know, makes the point that if the Boers could find a compromise within the empire, anyone could. Winston Churchill, interestingly, makes the point. Again, this is another international dimension to the story. A lasting settlement with Ireland would not only be a blessing in itself, but with it would also be removed the greatest obstacle which has ever existed to Anglo-American unity. And increasingly, I think America and how the war in Ireland is viewed in America is becoming a headache uh, for, for the British. They're very, very conscious of that propaganda war. Illustrated London News gives us this great front page from July 1921 of the Longfellow, Dev, and the Welsh wizard, David Lloyd George, getting down to the business of talking politics uh, in London. Didn't go anywhere, unfortunately. Lloyd George would compare negotiating with Dev to trying to pick up Mercury with a fork De Valera's retort was to use a spoon next time. Uh, I love this uh, illustrated uh, punch cartoon of Lloyd George, the kindest cut of all, and it's Ulster. Lloyd George made what has been described to Dev as a clear ambiguous offer of dominion status for the 26 counties as Southern Ireland as defined by the Government of Ireland Act when Dev had gone to London, essentially, and had that series of meetings with Lloyd George, it was very clear that the Republic was not on the table. And from the beginning, Lloyd George frames this Irish question, you know, as something that can only be answered within the colonial framework. It's a really dangerous game of politics um, that follows De Valera's unsuccessful visit uh, to London. And the first time we see this threat, and this is a threat that's used during the treaty negotiations. The first time we see this threat used by the British is in the House of Commons. Lord Birkenhead declares that hostilities on a scale never hither undertaken by this country against Ireland would be seen. That doesn't sound too unlike what Lloyd George says later on, immediate and terrible war. And I think that's the kind of language that's you know, very, very unhelpful in trying to get all air and back to the table of negotiating. Lloyd George then incredibly publishes the correspondence between himself and Dev uh, in the British press. And I think the intention there was to sow disharmony between the Irish public and uh, its leaders, a point well made by, by historian John Gibney. I think he's right that what the British now want to do is make it look to the Irish public like, well, we're willing to sit down and talk about the Irish question, but De Valera isn't, Dáil Éireann aren't. And this series of increasingly tense correspondence goes on for two months, basically, between Dublin uh, and London. No one seems to be willing to budge. And it's not until October that there's a second attempt. An Irish delegation departs for London. Crucially, it does not include Eamon de Valera. De Valera maintains the argument that he makes is twofold. He argues, one, that his equivalent, 
uh, was not at the table on the British side. The, the head of state, of course, in that case, is the monarch. Now, De Valera had gone to London before and had discussed politics with the prime minister, but now he maintains that actually his equivalent head of state is not at the table. He's also adamant of the need for his presence in Dublin. He believes that having to refer negotiations home, quote, added strength to the position of the negotiators. But within Republican Ireland, there's unease at the fact Dev is not going. Uh, W.T. Cosgrave asks, why was the best player on the team left in reserve? Interestingly, the image that we see here does not include uh, Michael Collins, and we'll get into that uh, in just a moment. But the decision of De Valera not to go as part of this uh, negotiating team, of course, that has been really the centrepiece of much discussion uh, around the treaty centenary, even 100 years on. I think it's the decision of Dev not to go more than the contents of the treaty that people talk about. Neil Martin danced around it uh, today when asked about it by journalists. What are they? People who travel over to London in, in October 1921, what power do they have? And this is very, very important, this letter on, 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 on doll air and paper. The plenipotentiaries. The plenipotentiaries have full power as defined in their credentials. It is understood, however, and th these two points seem to be in great contradiction. It is understood, however, that before decisions are finally reached on the main questions, that a dispatch notifying the intention of making these decisions will be sent to the members of the cabinet in Dublin, and that a reply will be awaited by the plenipotentiaries before the final decision is made. It is also understood that the complete text of the draft treaty about to be signed will be similarly submitted to Dublin and reply awaited. Now, this infuriates the British in the sense that it seems to delay any kind of progress being made. Every decision must be returned to Dublin and the Dáil. The Irish delegation, the Irish negotiators, I should say, uh, an interesting mix, Arthur Griffiths, uh, co-founder of the Sinn Féin party, TD and MP, you know, a member of the, the Dáil, the Revolutionary Parliament in Dublin. But all of these people, of course, were members of the Dáil because they had been elected in a British general election. Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Michael Collins. Collins brings something very unique to the table uh, in the sense, of course, Collins is Secretary of State for Finance in the Dáil, yes, but he's also a very senior figure. Uh, in the IRA and its intelligence war. And I would say it's, it's fair to argue that Collins is the closest thing the militant campaign, the military campaign, has uh, to, to a, a voice at the table of politics. Robert Barton, Secretary of State for Economic uh, Affairs. Interestingly, given that this talk is, is being presented by Richmond Barracks, Robert Barton was in Richmond Barracks in 1916 as a British soldier, uh, which is extraordinary. Uh, of these men, Three were interned in Richmond Barracks as, as, as Republicans after the Rising, including Griffith, who hadn't taken part in the Rising. Barton was there as a British soldier. So things change quickly in, in revolutionary situations. Eamon Duggan, uh, TD and MP, but also someone who had an involvement uh, briefly within the IRA's intelligence division during the War of Independence. George Gavin Duffy, very distinguished background in the law, which I think is very, very important to the delegation. Gavin Duffy had defended Roger Casement, Roger Gavin Duffy in 1916, unsuccessfully, but still a very brilliant defence. It was acknowledged all around. Uh, he travelled to Paris uh, with Sean T. O'Kelly, later the President of Ireland, when the, the, the peace conference was on, and tried to secure recognition for an Irish Republic. So he'd been on the world stage before uh, in that capacity. And I think what's important to say about the Irish delegation is that most of them, nearly all of them, had very little experience when it came to debating. I mean, they were members of a one party political system. When you look at the, what was sitting on the other side of the table from them, people like Winston Churchill, Lloyd George, you had conservatives and liberals, you had British politicians who had savaged each other in the House of Commons, who were, you know, Rottweilers politically. Uh, but the Irish didn't have that political debating experience. George Gavin Duffy, you know, given his, his, his prestigious career, 
uh, in the law and his ability to defend and to prosecute and to use that uh, performance ability. I think he brings something very unique uh, to the table. It's not just the people who are sitting at the table who are significant uh, to the story. Dal Aaron sends a remarkable delegation. Uh, it includes Erskine Childers, uh, later anti-treaty, executed in the Civil War. Uh, it includes Desmond Fitzgerald, poet, journalist, uh, one of the people behind the Irish Bulletin, which was the Dáil Éireann newspaper. And it includes really remarkable women, Kathleen McKenna, uh, who was the typist of the Irish Bulletin revolutionary newspaper, a paper that was basically printed, a highly seditious paper, printed during the War of Independence uh, in secret. Uh, she's part of that delegation. Other people are, are, are kind of curious. They, they bring a number of staff members from the Gresham Hotel, which is one of the favourite kind of doll air and hotels in the city of Dublin. A uh, chef, likewise, they try and rely on their own people uh, insofar as possible uh, within the delegation and to create a familiar surrounding uh, in London around the delegation. It says something about, I suppose, the fear of Collins around the media spotlight that Collins does not travel. Uh, with the majority of the Irish delegation. Collins travels a little bit later and in the company of quite a number of, of IRA intelligence men loyal to him who kind of act as bodyguards uh, for, for the Irish delegation in London later. So uh, the image of these Dáil Éireann delegates and the broader team uh, taking off uh, towards Hollyhead, it's, it's a remarkable image really. And it's a reminder that it's, it's not just the men at the table of politics, it's a revolutionary generation. Take up residence at 22 Hans Place in the very fashionable SW1 postcode, not far from Harrods. Uh, that building is still there. Michael Collins is actually photographed on that balcony. You can see, if, you, if you're ever there, the, the railings are, are as they were. Robert Erskine Childers serves as the Secretary General of the delegation. And the presence of the delegation in London attracts enormous press attention. Uh, at Hans Place, the word murderers is painted on the ground outside the home. I read an interesting account during the week that actually, rather than, than murderers, it was Michael Collins, uh, the murderer, that was painted uh, on the ground. But thousands also meet the Irish delegation uh, at Euston Station. So there's massive interest uh, in, in the delegation when they're there. A marching band playing the soldier's song. They attract all kinds of visitors. Uh, the dramatist George Bernard Shaw drops in to visit the delegation at Hans Place and the poet Ezra Pound. Uh, Ezra Pound was a friend of, of Garrett Fitzgerald, but he was very interested in, in Sinn Féin in the broadest sense. And he described meeting Arthur Griffith as the most illuminating hour of my life. But it's interesting that the, the war in Ireland, the, the way the Republicans have been presented in the British press as savages, as people who shot policemen in the back down rural Irish roads. And yet when they're in London, it's the great and the good of London society who want to meet them. They're painted by Sir John Lavery, the very distinguished painter from Belfast originally, who invites them into his home at the unfortunately named Cromwell Place. Uh, they meet people like Pound and Bernard Shaw. I mean, I think it's fair to say that no Irish people since the days of Oscar Wilde had caused so much celebrity. Uh, interest in London as the Irish delegation. You see these incredible images of the Irish diaspora gathering uh, on London street. Humoured there, the London Bobby kind of holding them back. But the waving of the tricolour in Euston Station uh, outside Downing Street, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real expression of Irishness uh, in Britain. You see other images of people on their knees praying as discussions are ongoing. The British negotiators a remarkable bunch in their diversity. Lloyd George, the Prime Minister. But look at this, the, the number of delegates that they use, the number of negotiators they use, you know, significantly more uh, than the Irish delegation. And they're constantly moving people in and out. So they're very, very good at creating that kind of atmosphere uh, of political confusion. Hammer Greenwood, Chief Secretary for Ireland. Greenwood was someone who was adamant, adamant in the behaviour of the Black and Tans in Ireland being justified, uh, a staunch defender of the policy of reprisals uh, to the last minute, really, 
uh, you know, someone who is, is very much regarded as being on the, the, the right of the right uh, in British politics at that time. But there's real political experience and skill in the Irish delegation. Uh, it's in the British delegation, but the Irish just can't match. For Churchill, it was the culmination of something that was a long time coming. 1912, almost a decade earlier than this, Churchill had spoken at a meeting in Belfast uh, in defence of the idea of home rule alongside John Redmond in 1912. You know, Ireland had been a political issue that had concerned Churchill for a long, long time. And now he found himself at the table trying to resolve what many felt could never be resolved. But there's people not at the table who should be there. John Gibney makes this point really well, you know, that the British side, they balanced themselves brilliantly between the Liberals and the Conservatives. There were people on the British side who were totally against home rule from day one, while there were also people who you know, strongly defended it. They got the balance just right. By comparison, the Irish delegation, they don't have that same diversity. For example, the Labour Party, which was an enormous political force in Ireland at that time, and had many, many seats across the country in local government, and actually were in you know, power sharing with Sinn Féin and many local authorities across the country. They're not there at all, and they had considerable influence over large sections of, of Irish life. So there's a lot more diversity uh, in, within the, the, the British side, as, as Gibney rightly argues, than the Irish. The Irish delegation are conscious, I think, to some extent, that this could break down at any time. Emmett Dalton, close confidant of, of Michael Collins, with Collins actually at Bailenham Law, uh, where Collins is, 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 is killed during the Civil War fighting, he recounts in his statement to the Bureau of Military History that there was so much fear among the Republicans that these talks could break down. They actually secured an aeroplane uh, in London so that Collins and others could be got away quickly uh, if necessary. In the end, they didn't use the plane. And we should look at what actually is in the treaty that was trashed out amongst those men. Popular memory has recalled the treaty as the document that divided Ireland. In truth, it doesn't really come up with partition. The Government of Ireland Act had already created the political entity of Northern Ireland. That was known. Ulster and partition would even be absent from dull debates on the treaty for the most part. What they were much more interested in was things like an oath of allegiance. Uh, and I find it difficult to disagree with Jonathan Tong, he writes that actually the debate over internal constitutional arrangements deflected some attention from partition for a so short time. It wasn't one of the big issues in how people talked about what was and what wasn't within treaty. The key bone of contention, of course, was that the symbolic head of state would be the British monarch, to which elected representatives would have to swear an oath of allegiance. The monarch would be represented in Ireland by a governor general. Ireland was to become a self-governing dominion of the British Empire, a status shared by Australia, Canada, Newfoundland, New Zealand, and going back to the Boers, the Union of South Africa. And Britain would continue to control a limited number of ports known as the treaty ports for the Royal Navy. And it was the great misfortune of Britain, actually, that they lost that. Uh, not long before the Second World War, when they would have come into very useful uh, effect. It's hard to disagree with the historian John Dorney that actually outside of these areas, the British conceded quite a lot, making the Southern Irish state much more independent than the Northern one. The Irish were given leave to choose any name short of Republic. British troops were to be withdrawn from the country, which was to have its own armed forces and a new police force. It was also to have full control over its fiscal policy, tariffs and customs. So this went above and beyond anything that had ever been on the table in the days of Home Rule. Martin, who actually signed the treaty, later opposed it, which was very interesting. Uh, the only member of the Irish delegation to sign the treaty and then reject his own decision. He maintained that it was the lesser of two outrages forced upon me and between which I had to choose. Erskine Childers, shown here, who was the secretary to the delegation, he also rejected the treaty. Both would end up fighting against it, Childers giving his life. Winston Churchill would recall him as a strange being driven by a deadly and malignant hatred for the land of his birth. He became something of a hate symbol 
uh, in British political discourse. Griffith was adamant that what I signed was a treaty of peace between Ireland and Great Britain. I believe that treaty will lay foundations of peace and friendship between the two nations. What I have signed, I shall stand by in the belief that the end of the conflict of centuries is at hand. I can't get away from this question of whether a threat was made of immediate and terrible war. Barton of the Irish delegation claimed that it was made by Lloyd George. But we actually also have a, an interesting account of it from the British side. Geoffrey Shakespeare, private secretary to Lloyd George, he remembered it too. And he remembered that there was something in the way Lloyd George said it. War was a terrible word, with at least six oars at the end. And the reverberation of the oars and the fierce look on his face conjured up to his audience the horrors of war. The idea that that threat had been made is utilised in a lot of anti-treaty Republican propaganda uh, in the months to follow. So this very powerful cartoon uh, from the Irish Republic shows Collins literally shoving the treaty down uh, the throat of an Irish citizen. You've got to swallow this or else. You know, the belief that the threat had been made was the treaty or war. Treaty coming to the end now, the last couple of slides, it's brought back to the doll. It's debated in the doll in late December into January 22. And when they vote on it on the 7th of January, uh, it's relatively close. You know, four votes would have swum the thing. 64 in favour, 57 against the Keown Corla and three others not voting. Now, there's a weird little anomaly under the treaty where it also has to be ratified by what's called the House of Commons of Southern Ireland, which didn't really technically exist. But it meant that they had to gather the pro-treaty TDs in their capacity as MPs for one day in Dublin's Mansion House. Four unionist MPs showed up as well. And it passed unanimously as the anti-treaty TDs refused to attend uh, on that occasion. But more importantly than that, it passes through the Republican doll, 64-57. Just to give an example of a pro-treaty speech or two, or an anti-treaty speech, which ties into what I was saying earlier on about the kind of language on both sides. Sean McKeown, General McKeown, he makes the point, look, what the people of Ireland want is not shadows, but substances. I hold this treaty between the two nations gives us not shadows, but real substances. In other words, this is the building block towards something better. Kahi, IRA Chief of Staff, is adamant. I'm not sure I agree with Mulcahy, by the way, but he makes the point that, look, we fought them as far as we can fight them. And he argues we haven't been able, those to whom the responsibility has been for doing such things, we haven't been able to drive the enemy from anything but a fairly good-sized police barracks. I don't think that's fair. I don't think it's reflective of how the IRA had actually fought in the war. But Mulcahy argues, look, we can't fight on any more than we have. And this threat of warfare is not something we should take like. Against the treaty, tend to see uh, a kind of ideological republicanism. Uh, you know, the, the, you can't make peace within the empire. Liam Mellows argues, the British empire is the thing that has crushed this country. You were told we're going into it with our heads up. We're going into the empire and now the empire's shame, even though we do not actually commit the act to participate in the shame and the crucifixion of India and the degradation of Egypt. Is that what the Irish people fought for freedom for? That's an interesting point because India and Egypt and other places are really heating up for the British at this time. And you have to wonder if the threat of Lloyd George, immediate and terrible war, is even possible, given the fact that the empire beyond Ireland seems to be in trouble too. You also get a sense of the tensions within republicanism. So, for example, when Markovich speaks, she says, my idea is the workers' republic for which Connolly died. And she's heckled from the floor. And it's in the Dáil record. They actually record heckles in the Dáil record, but someone shouts, you believe in a Soviet Republic. So there's, you can see the social tensions that exist within the Dáil, as well as the political ones. Divisions in republicanism are immediate. Come in the Mon, the women's movement rejects the treaty. A small pro-treaty group emerges within the women's movement called Come in Assyrtia, the pro-treaty Come in the Mon, but it's very small by comparison. The labor movement is ultimately divided. Labor doesn't really know what to do. They insist they're neither pro or anti-treaty, but pragmatic. If the country decides to confirm the treaty, then Labour uh, ought to be, that should have its representatives in the provisional parliament to work in Labour's interests, to frustrate reactionary measures, and to use every occasion to hasten the progress towards our ideal workers' 
republic. But it's interesting that it divides the broader picture of Irish republicanism beyond just the men uh, in oh, the IRA. General headquarters supports the treaty, including the chief of staff, Mulcahy. Uh, Michael Collins manages to bring most of the IRA's senior leadership with him. But as John Dorney, the historian, makes the point, it was a failure of the IRA leadership that they couldn't sell the treaty to the majority of the IRA. And even within the IRA's leadership, there's a handful of people, Rory O'Connor, Liam Mellows, Sean Russell, later chief of staff of the IRA in the 1930s, Seamus O'Donovan, and Carl Brewer, Minister for Defence, they reject the treaty. And there's something very powerful in that image of the IRA at the Mansion House, having rejected the treaty. I mean, going to a place of politics, a place that's synonymous with the doll, the Mansion House, uh, and rejecting the document. How did the people feel about it? To finish on these slides, the first elections in the Free State were held on the 16th of June, 1922, Bloomsday. Not that that was on their minds, held under proportional representation, uh, a planned pact between pro and anti Sinn Féin candidates uh, going into the election. They tried to push the issue aside. It collapsed at the last minute. A draft constitution of the Free State is published on the eve of the election, which collapsed the pact. But if you look at the first election held in the Irish Free State, I think it tells us something about how the public felt. Sinn Féin pro treaty. Is elected. They took 239,000 votes. The anti treaty, Sinn Fein, 36 TDs elected, 135,000 popular votes. But look at Labour. Labour, which had done its best to position itself outside of the treaty debate, they had 17 TDs elected. They only ran 18 candidates. Almost everyone who stood for the Labour Party was elected. And they got 132,565 votes in only 18 constituencies. You know, they only got 3,000 less votes than the anti-treatyites, despite running in only 18 constituencies. It's extraordinary. And I think, what does that tell us? It's really, it's often overlooked in how we look at the Civil War. I think it tells us that in the urban environments, in the cities, you know, that there was a, a, a desire to, 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 to move beyond just this question of pro and anti-treaty. Let the revolution and generation speak for themselves, I suppose. The last two slides are quotes, one pro-treaty, one anti-treaty. I think they tell us something about both sides that's very, very important. If you're looking for a quote that sums up the belief of the pro-treaty camp that this was an imperfect document, but it was the best that could be achieved and it would hopefully lead to something better. I think the best example of that is the speech of Collins uh, in the doll, defending the document. As one of the signatories of the document, I naturally recommend its acceptance. I do not recommend it for more than it is. Equally, I do not recommend it for less than it is. In my opinion, it gives us freedom, not the ultimate freedom that all nations desire and develop to, but the freedom to achieve it. And of course, that has entered Irish popular history as the freedom to achieve freedom, that quotation. But I think that really captures that sense of the pro-treaty camp. But on the other side, I think this quote from Helena Maloney, Abbey Theatre actor, Irish Citizen Army veteran of the Rising, and later to take up arms in the Civil War, I think it really captures something of the, the feeling of the anti-treaty side, that ideologically this was a betrayal. We thought we were going to do this big thing to free our country. It was like a religion, something that filled the whole of life personal feelings and vanities, wealth, comfort, position. These things did not matter. We saw a vision of Ireland, free, pure, happy. We did not realize this vision, but we saw it. So to some, this was the achievement of a vision. It was the stepping stones towards the free state, which in time became the Republic. But to others, of course, like Maloney, it was no such thing. And this is a remarkable centenary that we move into now, the civil war, because between 1916 and 22, you had that common cry of up the Republic, which meant one thing. But as we'll discover in the year ahead, you know, by 22, uh, it meant very different things on different sides. So I'll open it up for our observations uh, on that. Uh, thanks, uh, Donald. Doesn't seem uh, 
anybody took up the uh, so far has taken up the option of putting their questions into the uh, Q and A box. <clears throat> uh, I'll give them a, a few minutes to do so, just in case <clears throat> um, they didn't catch me the first time. <clears throat> um, but I'd like to sort of make an observation. You were saying that the Irish delegation uh, weren't great debaters. They were only used to the um, the one party system and so on. I'd make another observation. Neither were they good negotiators. They, I mean, at one stage, um, Griffith speaks to the other side on his own and yeah. comes to comes to uh, an agreement with the other side on his own. If anybody who had even the basic negotiating skills would know. That was a big, big mistake. Absolutely. And you, you as a, re a retired trade union official know exactly what you're speaking about there. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's very, very true. And it's very important to the story. Yeah. It's like the way they're, they're cornered. And it's not just, it's not just Griffith. It happens on occasions too. They're cornered individually. I think the British have a greater sense of who they're sitting opposite. Churchill is a very familiar figure uh, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, his interest in Irish home rule went far back. But you get the sense from the memoirs of, of the Irish delegation who travels to London. Some of the men opposite them, they know very little about. They don't have the same political awareness that the British have uh, of them. And they're very good, I think, at exploiting the, the, the visions within the Irish delegation. Uh, Sinn Féin in, in local government around the country was sharing power in a number of places with the Labour Party. The Labour Party rom in the, the 1920 local elections. And there were real you know, trashed out arguments between Labour and Sinn Féin on things like housing. Uh, around the country in various local bodies. So it's not that Sinn Féin weren't used to debating other parties, but at the level of the doll, they weren't. And I think that was a, a weakness that uh, people like Greenwood and, 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 and Lloyd George were able to exploit that political youth uh, very easily. Uh, there's one question. Most of the people are using the Q&A box to tell you how wonderful you are. Well, you know that already. Uh, but one person, Brian Marcy, wants to know how much personal danger was Collins in by going to London? Was he oh, given any assurance? Um, Collins felt he was in a great degree of personal danger and mem numerous people from the IRA's intelligence division, Liam, Liam Tobin and others, are in London, Emmett Dalton too. There are There is a, a, quite a lot of actually, IRA intelligence operatives who are very close to Collins who are in London at that time. There's arms, for example, uh, for that reason. Remember, the IRA would have had an active unit uh, in London anyway. The IRA is also very active in Manchester and Liverpool, Salford. So there is an IRA presence in Britain and it is possible to, to put guns into pockets. Numerous people talk about Collins often carrying uh, arms as he, as he moves through London. So he does feel uh, to some extent that he may be, may be in danger. And that witness statement, I didn't have time to go into it in any detail, Emmett Dalton's where he talks about securing a plane to get Collins out of there if, if needed. In that state of precautions, uh, that they'd taken. So if the negotiations had broken down, uh, getting Collins out of there was something Collins was very, very conscious of. And even the fact that he travelled to London separately from the rest of the delegation uh, is very telling about how he feels about his own safety. Uh, Cahill Cooney asked a question that I'm, th I'm sure uh, De Valera asked more than once. Uh, in Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, why did the negotiators not uh, refer to draft the treaty back to the doll? Yeah, and what time was it? What like I was only watching the the report on on the centenary report with McCullough, uh, and the point that they made really quickly and kind of brushed over was that this was signed in the early morning, which is extraordinary. That I think they had they had worn them down to such an extent uh, that the document is signed and I think it's two o'clock in the morning it's signed, which is extraordinary. Not a time for doing politics for anyone, but uh, yeah, I mean the, the Gavin uh, who we were talking about earlier on, Charles Gavin Duffy. Uh, he was apparently the last one to agree to sign to sign the document, and he was also adamant that it couldn't be signed in that manner. That you know the agree the the terms of agreement were that a draft treaty be returned uh, to Dublin. So yeah, their own the terms under which they had gone were broken uh, by the delegation in, in not referring it back to the doll. You're correct. Listen, Dublin, there's uh, lots of interest and lots of more questions, but I think actually we've run out of time. So. Uh, I'd like to thank you uh, for gi gi giving the talk tonight, and I'd also like to thank uh, all, all the um, 117 people or whatever who took the time uh, uh, to tune in. Um, just to say, we hope to see us again at some, some of our uh, uh, future events, as well as Monday at the Mess Talks. We've done several other events and programmes that you might be interested in. We run Tea Times Talks, a series of talks that celebrate the stories over 300 years of uh, Dublin history.
at 40 in Henrietta Street. We run cultural clubs, a series of hosted talks and tours that introduce and encourage people to connect with cultural spaces in the city. The National Neighbourhoods, a year-round programme that creates ways for people to see and make culture in their place with, with people they know. Uh, you can find all uh, about our other activities uh, uh, in our newsletter. So uh, with that, uh, good night to everybody and uh, see you again.